thank you for coming back. Um, Caleb Waldorf is an American artist currently living in Berlin. In 2007, he co-founded and is currently the creative director of Triple Canopy, which is an online magazine, workspace, and platform for editorial and curatorial activities. Since 2008, he has served on the committee for the public school. An open framework for pedagogy started in Los Angeles by Telic Art Exchange. Waldorf is an active contributor to Occupy Everything, an anti-capitalist platform dedicated to militant research, critical pedagogy, and public practices. And his talk tonight is titled Interface and Labor. Thank you, Caleb Waldorf, for joining us. Thank you, Joseph and Saul, for having me, and also everyone else uh, who's speaking in our, in our filter up in the front row. Um, so, my talk's called Interface and Labor, and that's, I'm actually not going to talk about labor at all, and the title is sort of a trick or kind of misnomer for myself to push a bunch of things that I've been thinking about and working on into a kind of like discursive framework. And so I gave a talk about this under the same title a few months ago, and kind of focused a bit more on the labor side of things, and tonight I'm going to focus on a sort of social media and kind of interfaces. Um, but it's basically like what I'll be discussing tonight is just one small module within a kind of like larger, larger project or a lot larger body of knowledge. Um, and I think uh, I was thinking about this during during the last talk that I'll probably I'm going to structure this a little bit differently. I don't want to. Uh, my friends in the room know that I'm I'm quite talkative, but I would I prefer talking with people than talking to people. So I think I'm going to try and sort of race through my materials for like 25 minutes or something and then open it up hopefully and even if like other people who have presented maybe could even come up because I am sort of interested in kind of actually having a conversation that's not so much of a QA and a um, amongst everyone everyone who's presenting and I'm also not going to talk about any of the projects really that Joseph mentioned um, Triple Canopy, the public school or Occupy Everything um, and this is for, I mean, the main reason for this is I, I think events like this kind of carve out a sort of space to actually do something different than, than what we already do. And so these projects that I work on are kind of ongoing. They're sort of everyday sort of practices that I'm involved with that, that for better or worse, have no end, end in sight. And so for me being here, like, I'm interested in actually kind of developing or working on something that I wouldn't actually normally, normally be working on. And so Occupy Everything is, 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 uh, is an editorial collective and a, and a platform, and it actually started a few years ago um, when I was involved in the kind of occupation movement in California. And since then, so this sort of a group of us in Los Angeles kind of came together actually around the public school and organized a bunch of events and direct actions as well as kind of publishing more pedagogical things as well. And so that's sort of the moment, I would say, like when, when I got most heavily involved in, in the occupation movement. Um, so this is, this is uh, indirect related, in direct response to the sort of crisis in education in the University of California system, which is basically tuitions were rising to these like, extremely high rates and kid, people weren't able to go to school anymore. And so a bunch of us organized around this because we'd either gone through the system or sort of were working with colleagues or kind of comrades that, that were in that system. And so at that moment, you know, a few years ago, and since then, and I, Oscar's, Oscar kind of mapped out quite a bit of this already, so I'm, but I'm maybe even like one module within his overall project, but I might be kind of incompatible with his project, so we'll see. Uh, the kind of rise of, so I've been obsessed since then with the kind of rise of social, social media technologies, both uh, using them and, and really kind of engaging them and being excited and tools like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube have kind of operated. But more recently, um, I've actually gotten very sad or sort of depressed about sort of after Occupy Wall Street, I've kind of actually have like an emotional visceral response and, and some of my sort of comrades and being arrested and kind of going through Occupy the Wall Street, getting Occupy Wall Street recently arrested in California. We all sort of feel like something's kind of kind of missing. And 
for me, it seems like there's a kind of um, the kind of the, yeah, this sort of euphoria of, of social media technologies has has caused a willful neglect of an imp important characteristics of those technologies, and that's sort of what I'm what I'm going to talk about. Um, and that willful neglect is is something that came up yesterday, but is uh, how they are linked to and in fact kind of can encourage participation in contemporary regimes of control and forms of subjectivity under neoliberalism or under cognitive capitalism. And so last week we were hanging out with some people um, and talking about Facebook. I talk about Facebook a lot with anyone who's around me. And some of them, uh, so someone mentioned... Um, an interview that, that had been published or is being published in a collection of texts for the for the Berlin Biennial this spring, and it's just a it's a back and forth between a curator and one of the bloggers from who is active in, in Tunisia, and it sort of really maps the kind of dominant poles I think of the discourse. So I'm going to start there and read this and, and then go on. And so the curator says, "You have a real critical spirit, but to use Facebook is also not innocent." To use Facebook means also to contribute to the wealth of a certain class in the United States. How do you position yourself in relationship in relation to that? And I'll return to <laughs> this. Might just be the theme of the theme of my talk because I'm worried that we're we're from the internet. Um, I'll come back to that later. And the Tunisian blogger responds. That reminds me a little of when I went to Geneva for the G20. I was confronted with that reaction too. When I was intervening there, I found amongst old militants the stereotype of a militant. When I mentioned the word internet to them, they said it's an American instrument to police the people to know when and where they are. For them, Facebook is multinational, etc. But for me, I don't care about the tool I use. What interests me is it what I can do with it. Is it because it benefits Mark Zuckerberg that I have to stop using it? If there, anything, if there isn't anything better at the moment? I've never thought about whether I would benefit Facebook. Quite the opposite. I see that I'm supporting an initiative that gives complete freedom to change. Zuckerberg is making a fortune because he was smarter than others. And so there's a, there's a lot to unpack here, both in sort of the, the, the question and the kind of response that are elicited. But I, I'm using it as an example because I think it's kind of the dominant, the, it's kind of the dominant discourse that I find when people are critical of, of Facebook. Um, and, and Johanna, the, the curator, uh, sort of suggests that using Facebook as a kind of collusion with the elites or like with, a, with the one person to use the Occupy discourse. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit later, but I don't think that's so interesting. What's more important to sort of focus on is the blogger's response, whose point of view in some ways I agree with, um, at least in terms of the, the kind of experience of things, but then what stands out is that his insistence that Facebook is a tool. And to talk about Facebook as a tool and sort of by extension the, the computer, to my mind, is a very hazardous thing to do. I mean, very dangerous because it's not a hammer, right? It's, it's not a tool. It's a, it's a significantly more complex thing than a tool. And so I'm kind of going to unpack that. And somehow I think that this is, we kind of know it. And so maybe in some ways I'm, I'm more concerned with the, with the discourse around these things and their, their actual usage. Um, but it's become pervasive, right? It's everyone that you talk to sort of has, has this sensibility. And it's given rise um, to somehow that there's a perceived impartialness to these technologies um, and in these platforms. And that somehow uh, this means that we can use them however we like without a kind of consequence. And because I think there's a kind of conflation taking place there, an erasure takes place of their inherent complexity and their what they're driven to do and what those sort of drives afford, afford to us as users of those systems. And from the very beginning of, of Facebook and Twitter in particular being used in the service of a um, uh, global resistance movement, this, is, this has actually been invisible. I'm going to read something very quickly by Mark Alvarez, he's a technology journalist based in San Francisco. And this is published in June 26th of, of 2009. I was at Structure 9 with a laptop all day yesterday, so I was shocked when I returned to the office 
and found out about Michael Jackson's death. The news was stunning enough, but what really astounded me is that my Facebook stream had suddenly turned into Twitter. For the first time I can rem remember, more than 90%, almost all in fact, of Facebook status updates, which had tripled in frequency in response to the news, were about the same thing. Indeed, MJ's death had one of the most profound pop culture impacts in internet history. The spike in traffic was so massive that it almost shut down ABC, CBS, LA Times, AOL, and CNN money. Twitter traffic rose to a level not attained since Obama's election in November. Co-founder of Twitter um, said the microblogging site traffic was double its normal volume after the news broke. And, on, and there were so many Michael Jackson search requests on Google News that the software interpreted as an attack requiring users to fill in CAPTCHA boxes uh, to complete the search. And finally, as often um, the case these days, the death was yet another instance of new media being beating the traditionals to the scoop as TMZ broke the story. And so this is, um, this is just a Google trend. I'm not sure if you guys have ever used Google Trends, but it's really fun because you can sort of see the trends and search terms over a given time. And so you see this kind of, it's a good way to sort of graph when there's a lot of activity centered around something. Um, and there's that, that peak, right, of, of his death. And so this is really fascinating in itself, that, that a pop star's death can cause such a, like, a quick reaction online that it actually stresses the infrastructure of the, of the internet. Right? It actually like, stresses and equips all these websites to, to, their, to their limit. And people sort of expressing um, their sadness, kind of a, a lot of good memories, not bad memories of Michael Jackson, sharing desktop wallpapers like I just showed you. Um, but his death also co coincided with something else happening at that time, which is the, the Iranian Revolution. So the, Michael Jackson's death was, a, I mean, two or three weeks into like the upswing of, of, the, of the Green Revolution and the uh, Iranian Revolution, which also had been the sort of, I think, for most of us, is the first time that a revolutionary or kind of resistance project had mobilized systems um, like Facebook and Twitter for organization, articulation, multiplication, and solidarity on both a micro and macro scale. And, and what I would argue is that Michael Jackson's death played a role, and a very significant one, in, in snuffing out the Green Revolution. And so, it, it's, I mean, it's a pretty simple line, and obviously that's tied into things that you were talking about previously with kind of forms of censorship, turning off the internet, etc. But the massive shift in attention that took place, this kind of quick pivot of, of this, these systems, changed the entire field, right? It changed the entire space of the revolution. And in this moment, as we watched our Facebook and Twitter streams become occupied by Jackson's death, it, it sort of opened up a kind of, I think, a... a a kind of pedagogical opportunity um, that could have shifted maybe our understanding about how, how social media technologies can can work within and operate within the within the space of, of resistance. Uh, but no one really, I guess, sort of had that conversation. I was trying to have that conversation. And nobody was really interested in having that conversation with me. Um, and this is you can also just see there's like one day where it's Iran and Michael Jackson. So that's the sort of moment. Um, and these are these two overlaid on each other. This is the first commercial computer. It's sort of a holder slide. Um, so, and so I guess it's like this lack of discourse or this lack of conversation that, are, that, that, that didn't happen maybe at the, at the beginning, of, beginning of all this. Um, seems to um, kind of emerge from this idea that, that social media technologies and computers are, are simply tools. And so it's kind of thinking about this so recently as I was sort of writing stuff down and kind of trying to map out some of this history. And I returned to a philosopher who was important to me when I was a bit younger and also when I started making websites. So it's maybe kind of an important thing to say is I make a lot of websites. And that was kind of marked a shift in my practice at some point. And the, the, the philosopher who sort of was kind of present or with me when, when, I, when that happened was, a, was a, named Wilhelm Flusser. And in 1981, he published a book called 
towards a philosophy of photography, and I came back to this essay recently, and by extension, another media philosopher named Matthew Fuller, uh, who sort of de dedicated a chapter to the Tufusser's thought in one of his books. And so I'm just going to summarize like a little bit of, of Flusser's discussion of the camera and kind of project it onto technology in general. Flusser talks about the camera as a post-instrumental apparatus, where an individual controls the functions of the apparatus thanks to its control of its exterior, the input and output, and is controlled by it thanks to the impenetrability of its interior. It then goes on to say, there are two interweaving programs in the camera. One of them motivates the camera into taking pictures, the other permits the photographer to play. Beyond these are further programs, that of the photographic industry that programmed the camera, and that of the industrial complex that programmed the photographic industry. That of the socio economic system that programmed the industrial complex, and, and so on. And so there's a couple of things to just I'm going to tease out from this. And the first is the technology brings with it and is composed of a set of forces and drives, or sort of affordances, and those intermesh with other forces and drives external to it. And more importantly, maybe, than that, is that those forces and drives are largely hidden from us, right? Um, and we can think about this very quickly and sort of push it onto computers, or the computers are much more complex than, than cameras. But, you know, the internet itself, uh, most of us don't know how to write code. We certainly don't know how to write the machine code that, that operates our, our computers. We, most of us don't know how the website works, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these sort of things happening are, are black box from us, right? They're hidden from us. But there's something that bridges this gap in understanding, and that's the, that's the user interface. So the windows and buttons and screens that we click on and navigate through. And so these in themselves are actually incredibly complex, even though they seem very simple. There's a sort of long history of their development. Um, excuse me. Um, and formed over decades of research and work tied to sort of post-war, I mean, you covered actually quite a bit of this, post-war information economies, neurological science, of course, the sort of media entertainment complex. What we know is that these interfaces and all their, their different forms urge us into kind of performing a very particular kind of function and behavior. And behaviors. In the case of Facebook and Twitter, of course, it's simply to just make us do as much as possible. Um, and I'll talk about this a bit, a bit later. But the kind of coercive force, let's say, if we could call it that, of the user interface is actually a really recent historical phenomenon. And so this has been sort of part of my work is to kind of actually now do a kind of compressed history of, of the UI. And so just bear with me as I go through this. It won't take very long. Um, and this, you can mention, this behind us is something that Sage, is called Sage, and it's featured next week in a film screening here called Dust Nets. Is that on Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, they have a different reading of it than I do. But anyway, so this is Sage, which stands for Semi-Automatic Ground Environment, an automated control system for tracking and intercepting enemy bomber craft used by NORAD in the late 1950s. By the time Sage was completely operational, the Soviet bomber threat had been replaced by the Soviet missile threat, for which SAGE was entirely insufficient to deal with. And within SAGE, there was a kind of fundamental paradigm shift that took place, and that's why I'm starting there, which was the introduction of the GUI, or the graphical user interface, for the first time. And so the screen became, this screen right there, um, became an input device for the user of the system, not for the programmers or coders. And so this is the first time, right, that, that someone using a machine like this wasn't directly interacting with the hardware, right? So there were users and programmers or coders, and these are kind of separated off from one another. And this brings me to sort of, you can actually see the kind of idea of the, of the network here. There's a really wonderful book that came out last year by Wendy Chung called um, Program Vision. I'm sort of going to be summarizing a bit of her thoughts from here on for, for the next page or so. Um, and she's really interested and in, interesting if anyone wants to sort of look at interfaces and sort of software as ideology. Um, and so, so Sage systems spread into like a number of different fields. It led to the creation of online systems, interacting computing, the internet, and then, you know, most importantly, the UI. And then this work was extended most famously by a, let's see, 
by this guy named Douglas Engelbart, who's an American inventor and early computer trailblazer. While at the Stanford Research Institute, he developed a computer interface element such as bitmap screens, the mouse, hypertext, collaborative tools, all in a platform called the online system, which these are, maybe if you guys are internet people, you've seen this. This is sort of the first online demo, and you can see kind of the mouse, the key command thing, a keyboard, and there are multiple screens and things are kind of overlaying one another. In, this was in 67, these stills are from 67 or 68. In, in 62, uh, Engelbart published a report, but it's kind of a manifesto called Augmenting Human Intellect, a Conceptual Framework. And I'd like to just read the introduction to it. Um, by augmenting human intellect, we mean increasing the capability of a man to approach a complex problem situation, to gain comprehension to suit his particular needs, and to derive solutions to problems. Increased capability in this respect is taken to mean a mixture of the following, more rapid comprehension, better comprehension, the possibility of gaining a useful degree of comprehension in a situation that was previously too complex, speedier solutions, better solutions, and the possibility of finding solutions to problems before they seemed insoluble. And by complex situations, we include the professional problems of diplomats, executives, social scientists, life scientists, physical scientists, attorneys, designers. Whether that problem exists for 20 minutes or 20 years, we do not speak of isolated clever trips, tricks that help in a particular situation. We refer to a way of life in an integrated domain where hunches, cut and dry intangibles, and the human feel for a situation usefully coexist with powerful concepts. Streamlined terminology and notation, sophisticated methods, and high-powered electronic aids. It sounds very erotic when I read it through this, this thing. Um, so there's a couple things to sort of take away from that. And the first is that the, the, in, in Engelbart's view, the human mind is incapable of learning uh, through a kind of leaps or a jumps, but rather through a form of accumulation and this kind of step-by-step -step training. Um, which sort of echoes some of like Frederick Taylor's sort of ideas about how to sort of train workers, but I won't talk about that. Um, in other words, like we need help, right? We need like a supplementary help in figuring out like not just a complex math problem, but everything that we engage with, all professional fields. And then two, Engelbart is not simply talking about uh, creating just a, uh, s some tools to use, but an uh, entire way of life, right? An entirely in integrated domain on and offline, even though there wasn't an online at the time. And so the interface, the, the user interface in this, within this logic, but also more generally speaking, then behaves as a kind of privileged representational shorthand for grasping a complex system that our minds and imagines, imaginations are unable to, to understand. And in this processing of ourselves, uh, there's a creation of a particular kind of user. And Engelbart offered up these ideas decades before the personal computer, but effectively these concepts became the foundation of thinking about the UI and users in general. And I don't want to suggest that the concepts that Engelbart laid out, I think that in, in the earlier talk this was pointed out, were independently triggered all, all that was to follow. The UI developed both adjacent to and within other things happening in CyberNet, shifting modes of production from Fordism to post-Fordism, post-Fordism developments in military technology and strategies and so on. But he did sort of effectively articulate much of what was to follow. And so I'm going to play, let's see if this works. So I want to focus, yeah, I'm just going to just play a bunch of interfaces for a few minutes. Um, maybe that's too quick. Hold on. I don't know how to change that, so I shouldn't do that in the middle of the talk. Okay, uh, so now I just want to talk a little bit about the user and then I'll sort of wrap up shortly. The control of the space of the screen through input technologies and interface elements introduces a kind of emancipation from the difficulty of the machine, right? So you no longer need to do with it, deal with the intricacies of code, the ins and outs of the hardware. And so this is this consequential for four reasons. Well, a few more, but four basic ones. So it shifts control from an individual to the layer, individual to the layer of software. 
and it does so for entirely practical reasons, it is more efficient and productive, right? So a person is no longer needs to be bogged down or even to learn to write code. What takes place in this movement or shift of responsibility is that the individual begins to associate their own actions on the interface as corresponding directly to the machine underneath and what that machine is able to accomplish. Two, this process requires a sophisticated ability to kind of curtain off. Oops, sorry, that was too quick. I'll just go back through these manually. Two, so, yeah, sorry. This process requires a, a sophisticated ability to curtain off or hide the complexity of the machine, separating technological systems from human systems. And when I say human systems, I mean the mouse and the trackpad and all of these things. And so the in interface comes to stand in, in, in for the machine itself. And, and yesterday when the cloud computing thing popped up, I was, that also becomes interesting because the machines are also evaporating themselves, right? So even have the eraser of the kind of machine. Um, three, the success of the interface rests on foregrounding human agency. So after all, if, inter if the interface doesn't clearly demarcate and train us how to, it's to be used, it doesn't work. Finally, the sense of control supports an idea of personal action and freedom. In this operation or flow, the interface produces a, a particular kind of user. And so just to reiterate, the responsibility for controlling the machine is abstracted from the individual through the interface through a concealment of complexity, which interpolates us as a user. And this notion has been solidified, I think, within the, within the last decade, um, especially with the kind of machines and their interfaces have finally caught up with the concepts behind them. And I'm saying this, you know, I, I think you can imagine, like the blue screen of death isn't like a present kind of thing. Like our tools actually have a tendency to work at this point. Um, in a way that maybe they didn't work 10 years ago or t certainly 20, 20 years ago. And so everything now is sort of a, is, is, is a click away. And I think that this, this reinforces a sort of individual sense of freedom, but kind of a very particular notion of freedom based on an individuated sense of control that allows us to feel as though we, as users, can survey, engage, and manipulate the complexity of the world through now it's just a tap of our fingers. In other words, we have been offered and, and, and more importantly embraced a very simplistic and reassuring space where our ability to click, navigate, and use simple, super simple software equates with a kind of individual sovereign, sovereignty or domination. This kind of individuated self-determination and command and choice also sounds quite familiar as this kind of primary compulsions or characterizations of life under, under neoliberalism. And so inscribing this notion of freedom at the level, at this level, has the effect to kind of erode desires for, I think, processes of collective, collectively defined and, and autonomous self-definition. Or at the very least, it creates a false sense that we somehow already have the means to do this at our fingertips. And so go back to the, go back to the Tunisian blogger very quickly, we'll stay on the screen. Um, for them, Facebook, well, let me say on that screen. For them, Facebook is a multinational, etc. but for me, I don't care about the tool I use. What interests me is what I can do with it. And I think we've seen a lot of amazing things that, that can be done with these tools, but what I'm trying to suggest is that in using them, some, some aspect of ourselves is being diminished. That what we are witnessing online from Tunisia to Greece to the university campuses in California is a kind of homogenized space, right, that actually evacuates the potential power of these movements. And so in moving forward, and this, and, and this is important to say, is I'm, I'm really sort of looking forward and, and less than backward um, to figure out kind of like what the next steps are. Because I think much is sort of being lost or not accounted for in, in our use of these technologies. And this is not to suggest a kind of exit or an exodus is, is in order, that we should all leave these systems and, you know, or design better interfaces, although this is somewhat of a good solution. What it seems to me is the next step is to take something being developed from those working on the ground in the occupation movements and apply them to the web, which is to say a kind of territorialization of space that makes 
visible the hidden dynamics of capitalism, the divine, the divide between public and private space, and our rights or non-rights to free speech and assembly. In other words, to put ourselves, which are significantly more complex than users, in places they aren't supposed to be. Online. And I have no idea what that means, basically. That's, but that's sort of where I see the, the kind of site or the sort of place of intervention to, to, to be. And it's not, you know, so I was sort of trying to figure out what some of these things could be, and it's not to generate more activity or to, like, overload the space with information. It's not to stop visiting or using these platforms, as that actually doesn't hurt the platforms or and offers very little to us. Um, but so one thing I've been thinking about is it would... We could purposefully begin to sort of misuse these technologies to understand their interfaces and the impact they have on us as subjects and do our best to, to resist those forces at all costs, and, and I think by whatever means necessary. So not to um, just say simply it's a tool and I'll use it for you know, doing this thing and then I'll, I'll sort of leave it. Um, and Joseph and I were talking about uh, you know, Twitter yesterday. And suggesting, you know, so, so what Twitter does is it, it essentially, like, forces you to take a whole bunch of ideas and kind of shove them into this very small form. So maybe you shouldn't do that, right? Maybe you should, if you really want to articulate something in a different space, you, like, find an alternative way to do that. If you're, if you want to have a conversation that's about this sort of issue or you want to sort of discuss these things, don't use private, privatized tools, right? Don't use things like Facebook and to have public conversations, right? So I think there's all these kind of little micro strategies that, that you can do, but I, the thing that seems most, most easy in some ways is to manipulate or cre create new systems that parasite off of existing ones and steal away the kind of positive components while leaving the other forces behind. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a project I made this icon that's been on, this is an icon that's been on the screen for a while. And so this is, I guess, um, as a kind of working on, I was thinking about all of these things and basically was getting obsessed, you know, been obsessed with Facebook and sort of looking at Facebook and actually did kind of a analysis in the history of the UI, but it kind of required me to really pay a lot of attention to Facebook. And it's not public yet, but there's not any reason for that other than I haven't uploaded it, um, but maybe I do this tomorrow and you can post a link or something. And it'll be in a um, Ment, which is a journal that Federico runs. And so it sort of goes back to the, the curator's question about Facebook generating wealth. And Facebook, last year in 2011, made um, uh, a, billion, a billion dollars, and 85% of that came from self-service ads or targeted ads which I think we know how that all works, but just to reiterate, it's basically your activity on Facebook, your commenting, your sharing, filling out your preferences, allows Facebook to, uh, has algorithms that detect that stuff and serve you ads based on what it thinks that you're gonna, you're gonna wanna buy. The primary sort of thing that, that this algorithm operates on is the like button. Um, and the like button's not just on Facebook. There's something like three billion likes from external from external websites to Facebook every day. And so the like button success demonstrates one way within the sort of larger thing that I've been discussing that the interface has kind of been instrumentalized in the service of economic inter uh, interaction within our, within our current form of capitalism. And one thing I think we know about immaterial and effective labor is that today's workers are sort of generally required to, to express a positive attitude and sort of display proficiency in communicating within like a limited linguistic framework so that everybody kind of understands themselves. And to master these skills is to be a productive, effective worker. And so the, the like button is a, is a perfectly optimized system for not only extracting value from that behavior, but also training, at the, the simultaneously training someone to better fit with, into the larger workforce and society in general. And so each time we like something, our, productive, our productivity increases while our communicative skills actually are homogenized and impoverished. And so what I decided to do... Okay, so here's Facebook updating live. He is a tool. Um, so... Does anyone very quickly notice something about it? Only been around for a 
up in six minutes. There's no like button. Right, so, <laughs> so basically, I, I mean, being obsessed with something, so I was really obsessed with it, I was thinking a lot about this, and, and what I decided to do is just remove it. Um, and this happens, I can just show you really quickly, it's the title of the thing is not what I like. Um, so it just happens to like a little bit of code, right? So it's a little CSS, the, the, the top are um, some CSS classes, and then you display none, and that overrides the internal style sheets. And so basically, uh, this was a, and it's a browser plugin, so it's for Chrome or Safari or Firefox, but I haven't finished the Firefox one. But so essentially, and I've been using this for about three months, so I haven't had a like button um, on Facebook in, in a really long time. And it's, it's actually, I mean, so maybe we can talk about this as a group, the kind of like effective dimension of this, but it's quite intense to not have a like button, right? And so it, it's, it's, really intense, it's a really intense feeling. And I think that this is something that I, I mentioned before. There's this kind of idea that potentially we need there's alternative peer-to-peer -peer networks and these other systems, but actually what takes the, the favoriting and liking still exists on those systems. So those UI systems are actually sort of prevalent, whether you're on Facebook Facebook or not. So in, in the one sense, you're still being trained. You're just not making money for someone else. Um, and so that's why I felt sort of this is maybe perhaps a more interesting intervention because it just sort of reduces, it kind of subtracts the most uh, sort of despicable element by, while leaving the rest intact, right? While leaving all the people still there and uh, the ability to, co to communicate still there. But this kind of removal of the like button, and, and I really hope that people use it. We'll see if people download it and use it, it completely changes uh, your interaction on the platform, right? Because you no longer have this sort of quick form sort of communicating with someone. You have to like write a note or you have to find like a ASCII heart to put in or something. You have to share something. Like it actually fundamentally changes. But what it doesn't, but it doesn't remove all the sort of productive capabilities of that platform, which are to kind of see a lot of things that are happening and connect to a, to a lot of um, things that are, that are going on. And I think I'll stop. I don't. I think I'll stop. I don't want to talk about the public speaking, really. Um, I did, or maybe I'll take a pause, and if, if the the public school comes up, I can talk about it. But actually, I'd like to not, not talk about. It. And just end there, and maybe we can have a conversation because it's already so. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so all it'll be, I can just show you, so you go up to, in Chrome, if you go to extensions, it's not, not like, I have to change the icon, that's the old icon. And then basically you'll just be able to go to the Chrome extensions page and you just download it and then it's in your browser, that's it. So, yeah, like in Safari, Firefox, it's just an extension. I mean, all it is is a, it's like a manifest JSON file, some images, and a CSS document. It's very, very simple. Um, I mean, it literally took... 18 minutes to make or something like that, but it's been a kind of nice, nice thing to have. Um, um uh, there is one thing that I'm curious. Maybe I'm asking for a degree of what are you going there? Just. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you mentioned earlier that in using online tools, some aspect of ourself is being diminished. But in your presentation, it wasn't exactly clear to me, and maybe you're only, you know, I'm not wanting to become too broad here, you only brought up the example of the like button, and you very briefly discussed exactly what that diminishing consisted of. And I was reminded of the essay um, by Guattari that was actually included in the reader for a course that you organized at the public school to mm -hmm. so have done with the massacre of the body, where he very specifically speaks about uh, what what this diminishing consists of. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, I was, I was kind of, it struck me in your presentation how you didn't really speak specifically about how you felt you were being diminished. You more, you more uh, were intent on laying out a, 
the analog line of the user interface without speaking about the implications of that interface. So, and maybe it's because you wanted that, you wanted to shift that. Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> welcome, to, welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's this discussion, uh, but I was wondering if you could maybe uh, elaborate on that a little bit. I mean, it's super, I think there's two, no, there's more than two. I mean, it's, it depends if you want to, I think, talk about it, um, kind of at like a sort of, I mean, you can talk about it at an effective level, you can talk about it at a, um, in, in terms of uh, sort of conceptions of freedom, let's say, or sort of notions of, what, of, of collectivity. Um, so I think it diminishes a kind of, it reduces, so here's a, the like button, or Twitter, or hearting something, or favoriting something on YouTube. What they do is they kind of reduce all of these complexities of human interaction to this very simple, understandable form. So it's a dim dim diminishing of the complexities of interacting with other people, right? So that's one thing, um, and that's within the within the space of within that within that space. In terms of freedom, I think I, I mean I don't. I always feel strange talking about freedom, but it's, it seems to me that, and this is my personal, the, here I'll tell you an anecdote that's better way to do it. So within the, the, this collective I'm in called Occupy Everything, one of our members spends all of her time on Facebook. Um, and it's been a really big problem with, with our group because what happens is that she's having a lot of conversations with, with um, really super amazing people and doing a lot of important work, and she's a kind of incredible guerrilla kind of activist, and all of her work is, is exists exclusively, not only exists exclusively in the space of Facebook, but also like her collaborators, the, like us as a group of people, um, they can't see what she's talking about because we're not friends with the other people, right? So you have this kind of diminishing potential of kind of collaboration, right? It is, to think that that sort of discursive space or like being able to easily, as I mentioned, like easily chat with your friend, that that somehow, that kind of, it, it's taking place in a private space that actually lots of people don't have access to. And there's no kind of potential opening up of that space. There's no risk of kind of, kind of something emerging, some sort of self-definition that emerges with other people. I mean, of course it's gonna happen at certain scales. I mean, I'm speaking sort of generally, but I think that that's, that and then I, I guess on like an effective level, um, it's harder for me to talk about effect. But it, you know, what I what I feel like is that actually a friend, my friend Nina was talking about this in a class at the public school, is the kind of readiness of when you sign into Facebook, the kind of like looking up and seeing those icons and really like that kind of emotion, kind of like immediate physical kind of perking up when you sign onto the site as the page loads. Right, and so, and, and what you're waiting for is a sort of simple, like, poke, I mean, poke, they used to have pokes, but it's this very simple kind of reassuring, right, this kind of reassuring moment of interaction with anyone. And to me, that's not a very complex interaction, it's a very simple interaction. Um, that, it, that, if that if that opportunity wasn't there, it's like maybe other things could be articulated, I guess. Does that answer any of that question? Yeah, I think I think that's um, yeah. Oh, and also, I mean, the thing is too is that the the um, is that I also feel like I'm a, I'm the 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 user that I was describing is also like is is also me. I mean, it's. I was participating in all of those things. And so right now it's like, and so that's the temporal kind of component, right? It's actually a kind of quick view. It's, it's to say, all right, especially in post-occupied Wall Street, certain things crystallize, and I think there's, there's negative tendencies within the resistance movement, and this kind of need to be dealt with now. And maybe this is one way to sort of deal with thinking about that now, and maybe in six months or a year, like there's another kind of issue Sort of, I'm just a little bit less, um, or like a little pessimistic, right, about what what to do next. And I think a lot of like people I'm close with are pessimistic as well. With that, yeah. Anyone would like to help Caleb feel more optimistic? Now is the time. 
I mean, I'm happy. I'm happy, but I'm just a little pessimistic. Um, I just wonder if you can, can talk upon the fact that this simplification goes with the interface in terms of discourse, what is implied, you know, in terms of language. So with the interface, we have this simplification of language and everything becomes low and low. Reduce, you know, we have this diminishing process. Mm -hmm. And so, what, for you, how do you see this in relation to the articulation of the discourse and the need of articulation? Now, we have been discussing this in relation to the Occupy movement. Yeah. And, the, and I guess for, for both of us, the problem was okay, now that we are occupying, the next yeah, step yeah. is a, an articulation, yeah, yeah. an articulation of meanings, you know, and the needs and desire. And so, how are these simplification, this process of diminishing effect. I, don't, I mean, I, I don't know exactly. Like, I don't know what, how to, I mean, we've talked about this, so I feel like it's a little bit of a sneak attack because we talked about it. I was like, I don't know! <laughs> I don't know what to do. Um, I, guess the, I guess the thing, where I, I can tell you where I put my energy which maybe answers the question without answering the question. It's it's in sort of developing new platforms, right? And and I mean this like thing is like kind of a little project. It's not like a serious thing, but it's actually investing a lot of in time in, in developing new systems, right? Developing complex, interactive, pedagogical systems. And to me, that seems to be a way of articulation, right? Is to build actual counter counter institutions without the negative aspects of the institutionality. The things can be articulated by a kind of, because what happens when you create an institution, you create a space like that, it sort of, it's a, it kind of works like a, it's kind of like a glacier, right? It just starts like pulling things along with it, right? It kind of starts dragging everything around and all those people around with it. And and if you, if you do that, then what happens is you actually have seems kind of quite modest at the top, but underneath there's all these other things kind of being dragged and pulled along with it. And that's a form of articulation, right? Because it's a kind of thickness. It's a kind of kind of thick body that's moving through through the currents versus uh, and, uh, like a quick moment on a quick blip, right? A quick protest in, in one space at one time, right? That kind of dissipates really quickly. I don't know, that's sort of how I do think about things. I mean, that's all I do basically, is do things like that. Because I think it's more interesting, that's, a, that's an articulation in a way that um, was more useful maybe than like a kind of manifest or something. Yeah, but do you see a way of twisting this uh, simplification into a kind of, from a kind of a negative or a simplification that basically function as a kind of sort of a process of homogenization yeah, yeah. Like how we to make see it. a twist and use this simplification as a form somehow of resistance. Can you see this possibility? Do you think that this is possible? I mean, I think in some ways it's it's already. Ha I mean, it's happened. Like the simplification of these tools and these interfaces is 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 used in productive ways. I mean, I'm not trying to suggest that it's exclusively unproductive. I mean, if you can get you can have, I mean, these are traditional political models. It's like you, a bunch of people sign a, sign something and then something happens with the, you know, I mean, it's, there's a lot of different political systems up here, so I'm not sure how to talk about this, but you know, I mean, that, that like, that kind of simply, those simple systems sort of work. What I'm concerned about is that those have become the dominant system. So the twisting, I think it's okay to use, it's not, that's what I'm saying, it's not like, you don't want to leave Facebook necessarily, but maybe to kind of do it in a more careful way or something, to, to sort of, that's a twisting, right? So not let it operate on you, not to like interpolate on you. And, and then you start thinking about everything in terms of this kind of very binary and simplified form, right? So that to me is where that twist happens. It happens in the kind of individual or kind of collectivity that can, you know, us talking about it, figuring it out. I don't know if that's really, if that's not the case. No, it makes sense. It yeah. makes sense. It's somehow we're getting some sort of agency, you know? So yeah, yeah. you can twist simplicity and simplification if you start thinking of it and like, okay, how we use interfaces. Yeah. Yeah. 
any other oh. thinking about the interface as a kind of uh, relationship with control or something, putting some barriers to, 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 to design a path, you have to follow it, etc. And uh, with this uh, marketing-based uh, discourse about the uh, whole interface design, thing, user design, uh, perception design, experience design, excellent experience design. And uh, I think we need some, uh, we need deep a little, little bit about this uh, interface design. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel, for example, myself uh, more free with uh, some, uh, not really interfaces. I think mean, when I get too uh, deep in the, the system, I take this one and put freeze it. But it's no, uh, uh, user manuals and etc. Uh, but also, at a time, time the big public, the grand public, the standard people, needs this kind of uh, interface. How we can subverse the interface to, to integrate this? I think it's uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it, this also goes back to the, the to what I said to you because what, so the thing with interface design is that. I mean, there's, there's, it seems like there's two trends at the moment. One is the, the kind of um, the science of it, right? The sort of mapping of kind of eyes and clicks and all of this, and sort of that's. I mean, that's the Facebook model, and it was the Google model until recently. They actually hired some visual designers. Like they, Google had like three visual designers for like 15 years. It was all UI designers, and so there's kind of this this sort of analysis sort of space. But then you have the Apple space, which is. Um, a more, let's say, like modernist approach, right? So these things kind of happen. They do some studies and stuff like that, but it mainly is like some brilliant guy comes up with an idea and then they put it out on the public. And one of the things that's interesting about uh, one of the things that's interesting about those two systems, I'm just bringing up some observations and, and I'll tie it back in, is that with the Facebook and sort of let's say the Google model, this kind of uh, standardized model. Um, it's kind of bleak modernism, let's say. Within the Apple thing, it's a kind of, um, they've embraced skeuomorphs, right? Skeuomorphs are things that replicate things that um, aren't necessary, right? So like when you open Apple, it's like a paper, right? That's a skeuomorph, right? Go for the calendar. And, um, and, and that to me is like it's sort of two dominant modes of interface design at the moment. And so I think, and, and, those, and, and those models then trickle down, right? They kind of, you know, these, Three, I just mentioned three of the largest companies in the entire world, and what they're doing then trickles down to everyone else. And some of the things they do, we need to use, right? Like we need to put our header at the top of a web page so that people like are familiar with these systems. But then there's certain like tweaks. I think that you, that, that as designers, I mean, this is I think a responsibility of UI designers and visual designers to make it, like to try different things and to experiment in that space without the resources to do so, right? So millions and billions of dollars are spent on interface design by those people. But we can sort of learn and take and sort of, that's the one that these are systems, these are knowledge systems, just like every, you know, they're knowledge systems. And sort of to take some of those systems, kind of unpack them, look at them, unpack them as a kind of like critical practice and then recombine them into new forms. And then you create other models. Very simply, it's, it's Triple Canopy is the magazine I work on. And, um, we started some years ago. And this is just an example is that, that basically we were, this pre iPad, we wanted to create like a, a reading experience online that didn't encourage, um, uh, that encouraged a, a deep level of, act of attention, right? So resisted the kind of attention, attention regimes of. of 2007, which are a little bit different than now. And so, very simply, what what I did, I mean, I was designing the UI, is I removed the scroll bar. That's it. I mean, so there was horizontal. It's like, it, it's, the website looks like it's an iPad. I mean, like, it's a new iPad app, but I did it in 2007. It's very simple, right? It was very, removed everything, and then had everything in horizontal columns. Very minimal gesture. 
Um, but I think, but, but that effectively did the trick, right? That's all that needed to be done. You know, we talked for months about like, okay, well, we want to start this long form writing, theory, arts, culture website. Like, how do we do this? How do we design this? Or do PDFs, whatever. And for me, that was just simply sort of thinking about looking at the paradigms, like the bogging paradigm, the rebogging paradigm, all of these things that were existing at the time. To me, it just seemed like to slow things down, we had to just immediately situate the user in a way that they knew something different was happening. So that, to me, is like a practical solution, is to actually unpack these knowledge systems and then recombine them into new, into new systems. If that makes sense. Yeah, because uh, sure, you are right. And uh, interface is one of the key elements of uh, information design and management. And uh, they manage the information flow. But this, uh, for example, I remember, if, I don't know if you remember, there's, there's a, a project of a group of artists uh, called Stalker. Stalker Web was, for example. It was very interesting after. So this diet, I think uh, you need this kind of new, new browser uh, project, for example. I don't know. Uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, we raise the yeah. I mean, it's also, it's the thing too that's interesting is that the projects and projects people. Yeah. Um, I mean, the projects and projects is a group that, like, I think does really interesting world and uh, do, does really interesting work and kind of bridges the gap between the, um, sort of the art world and let's say like the corporate design world. But within the, the actual like art, like the sort of art world and kind of people working in social practice and these things, there's not that many people that, that work on that work on interfaces. And somehow like identifying as like a kind of visual designer, UI designer is still kind of like bad territory or it's a sort of the kind of professional craft or something like that. And to me that that needs to change because I obviously I think like the interfaces where a lot of power operates. And if you want to untangle power, no matter what your art practice is, I mean I used to do very different work before I started doing this, but to have a sort of similar motivation, it seems like okay, I have to start doing interfaces if I really wanted to kind of adjust to certain how certain things were working. So yeah. Um, we we've, we've got to move on to oh. The next presentation, so we're just going to take maybe one or two more comments. Um, I have a few comments to uh, the presentation and to um, as well. Uh, first, I think that one one technique to develop uh, interesting interfaces, or like with the problem that you mentioned, like on the one hand we have we want to design extremely simple things that people just click and go, right? Uh, um, because you want to, you know, the companies they want to reach masses. That's the reason they want to do it extremely simple. But oftentimes there's this technique where you apply a very basic uh, interface and then uh, iterate it and it improve or develop its context over time. One example is, for instance, Facebook now has a like button, but soon, actually, if you may, I think some of you may have this, there's a watch button as well. I button. saw that today and uh, I was like, oh, things like that, you know, <laughs> this, this is the second button. version of it and we will soon see that you know, there will be all these different types of buttons. Um, and they will all have, have icons, of course. Yeah. This one, just comment on your question. And second thing, I think uh, in general, when, yeah. first is when you watch a Guardian article, you click on, uh, sorry, watch button, when you click on a, uh, when you are watching a YouTube video, let's say, you think, uh, not the like button, but the watch button. That means you watched it. <laughs> Count it, basically. I mean, it's not that you like it, but you watched it. It's like different types of... Uh, or you read the article. If you didn't like it, you read it. It's more detailed information that you that they, they, they capture from you. Yeah. Um, it's a long story we can discuss this further. There's like a lot of things about it. But second thing... Um, your, uh, I forgot its name, on factory icon, uh, your JavaScript application for no, the no, extension. Like yeah. uh, <laughs> I liked it, first of all. It's a nice and cool and very quick one. Um, but I think uh, there are two types of assistance to actually appropriate uh, structures at the moment. One of them is like you did, it's like ignorance. You ignore not the like button or you just left, just leave, you know, Facebook. Many people do this, our friends do this. 
And the second type of uh, resistance is the, uh, to actually find a hole and exploit it. Right? Like you, we see it as well, this is hacking in general. And first, I find your application in the category of ignorance. And what do you think about it? Because I think you said ignorance is leaving this exodus. Ignoring, yeah, leaving or just ignoring the buttons, like buttons, like we did, for instance. You remove the button from the interface, right? Yeah. It, uh, that your tool or it's your subtraction. Tool. I would say it's subtraction versus leaving. So I say it's I a maybe, yeah, I mean it's a it's a, it's a maybe I give I don't think I do. I think I think that it, I think what it's about is that this this little this little like button, this very very small thing, is incredibly powerful. Like it's incredibly incredibly powerful, and so I, you can't ignore it. Like if it's there, you actually can't. I would say, I would say it's very difficult to ignore it. And so one strategy is to sort of subtract that dynamic. In terms of uh, in terms of, I mean, I think there's also there's a number of different there's a number of different stories. There's more than two. I think exploitation. I didn't see. I'm just going to respond to. I'm not. I won't respond to exploitation. But there's also my my friend, um, a, a long time collaborator collaborator Sean Dockery. We did a class on manifestos at the public school, and, and so we were like writing manifestos, and he won. He wrote one on Facebook suicide, and what Sean pointed out is. The kind of the the leaving Facebook, um, and this is a, this is a while ago. The leaving Facebook or the sort of quitting Facebook isn't going to fundamentally change Facebook, right? The way that you actually enter, it's not to hack Facebook; it's to insert as much noise into Facebook, right? So the way that you would destroy Facebook is by liking everything, sharing everything, friending everyone, so that your data becomes meaningless. Like that's that's actually a much more interesting way to exploit the system and to sort of make it make it. Pointless than to like hack it, let's say, or sort of hack someone's account. And my my and, and and my thinking about this is somewhere sort of in between, right? It's sort of like a it's it's not it's not suggesting it's a more practical solution, let's say, than like Sean's like liking. I mean, it take a lot of energy. Well, what Sean says, uh, I don't think very well as well. But what, what he says is uh, like the way I say as well, like exploiting a hole. Versus like if you write a program that likes everything. It's, a, it's an exploitation of uh, the whole in the system. Yeah. Just open like uh, functionality, let's say. But that's not but, an, uh, with liking everything is not an exploitation. It's it's, it's actually more, doing exactly what it's meant to do. It, it, it's not a hole in the system. Like Sean said, it introduces noise to the Facebook like uh, say data. But not through a hole, through through what it's actually meant to do. It's not that's not a hole in the system. A hole in the system would be like uh, more, I think of like a, a gap in the, maybe a gap in the programming. It would, whereas that's what Sean was saying really about Sean, even if you want to call it an exploit, is that it's it's doing exactly what it's meant to do to like uh, to the maximum dimension, right? It's kind of overload, and that to me is like a totally fascinating way to think about it. But it's not a whole. Because it's exactly what I mean. Maybe sorry, this is not. This is like a yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, 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 sorry. I think that's it. For me, it seems like you're oversubscribing to the logic of the system. They are not actually it's what they call. But I, I think that we should move on to the second presentation. But I did want to maybe Laurel doesn't want to enter in here. But I was curious to see how you think about user interface in terms of kind of contemporary art spaces or our experience of kind of uh, interacting with contemporary art and. Uh, Specifically, with respect to these interfaces diminishing our capacity to meaningfully communicate with each other, and this seemed like something that, at least, was there was a bit of this present present in Laurel's presentation uh, last evening. I don't know. Do you would you want to respond in this space or maybe not? Okay. Sorry for doing this to you. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, I I think that's a interesting comparison. I mean. I was really fascinated by this slideshow that you had kind of inside your slideshow, which was this um, very interesting kind of visual research about how interface design had evolved over time. Um, and I guess, you know, um, maybe 
uh, there's something in that that makes me think of like the way that one is trained as a curator to like actually look back at the moments of the evolution of those things to try and un grasp or understand what's fluid about them, what changes, and why they change. Um, so on one level, I was just kind of curious to hear more about that research, which um, you kind of showed this in a very visual way, but I felt you probably have some interesting observations about how those evolve from one to the next, and how you know power kind of operates through those visual mechanisms. In each one, it seems to me like it kind of morphs and builds on itself. And I was curious about that. Um, and the only other thing I was wondering is, is uh, the kind of path not taken <laughs> that you suggested in your um, title for your talk about labor. I was just curious about why you decided to not go that route. The, the, I don't actually have a good answer to the first question, so I'm not going to answer it. It's more of a kind of like um, a fetishism of the vernacular, let's say, or a kind of critical intellectual position. So I don't think it's useful. Like, I would speculate on some stuff, but I don't have a kind of deep-seated analysis on that, so I just won't respond. Um, the path not taken, it's simply like, this is a, I gave a talk called Interface of Labor the three months ago or four months ago or something, and I talked just sort of about labor, from like Taylorism to Fordism to post-Fordism and effective labor and its relationship to the sort of, I didn't talk much about the interface, I talked mostly about that stuff and then how it sort of crystallizes in something like the like button. And so while that is like a good exercise, there's much, there's people who are much more, I mean, the guy who can talk about this stuff better than I can. There's a lot of people who are talking about kind of like immaterial labor, effective labor, like every sort of, everything that you open up, it's like it, that's present, right? There's a lot of people sort of addressing this and thinking about that, and that's helping my thinking as well, but no one's really talking about these sort of interfaces. And so for me, it's just like, okay, well, this is more useful to talk about as a kind of little discursive little thing to throw out than to talk about the labor stuff, which I think a lot of people have done really good analysis, and I could rehash that, but I also don't know. But I, I took you to be drawing the link between those two, and that's what I'm interested in maybe in you elucidating. Like, what is the relationship between labor and those other interfaces? Like, what's the link that you're trying to draw? Well, I think it's, I mean, the, the user, this is what I said, is it's kind of parallel development. So, I alluded to this when I talked about uh, with the, the Douglas Engelbart quote, is that his approach to sort of thinking about like human sort of cognition or sort of the way that the people sort of operate and this kind of way of life thing is very much a kind of high Fordism idea of the sort of subject, right? So basically, you have the kind of tailor, this like very particular sort of mean, this mechanisms of sort of training and this kind of the machine, like I said, how to bend the, the person to the kind of machine. And then, on the other hand, you have sort of four, I mean, this is both Taylor and Ford, kind of combined, but this, like, this sort of pedagogy, right, of like this sort of pedagogy of the worker, right? And so for Ford, it was really important early on, in sort of the teens, this kind of training, right, this kind of training of people on how to be consumers. And so, I, so, so these things are echoed in the kind of Figure, like that figure, right, that kind of figure under Fordism to me is echoed in the kind of logic of Engelbart. And then sort of high, I mean, uh, the cybernetics thing I'm not so good at talking about, but then you also have uh, these, you know, you read these sort of particular kinds of notions of, of freedom coming out of like the neoliberal philosophers that also then begin to echo with, with this and the sort of, the, the sort of choice being grounded in this kind of ability to click and control and sort of do these things in very particular ways. And so this kind of, and I, I mean, it's sort of pointing to some of that, but I mean, that's the, these are the kind of things that, that are sort of floating around. But it's also like a huge, I mean, it, it'd be a good dissertation topic if I was like writing a dissertation, but I'm making websites most of the time. So, you know, for me, it's like, a, like investigating sort of one component and then sort of doing that and then maybe I show over it sort of go back to the labor thing or something, because it's more just like an excuse to talk about something or think about something than a kind of, yeah. Okay, we're running a little behind schedule, so we're going to move on to the next presentation. Um, Caleb, thank you very much. Thanks.